it's a 460 foot tunnel which leads on to one of the most impressive sites of the canal network. So here I am on the Klangoffen Canal. Up that way is the aqueduct no one can pronounce and here is 26W. So we're walking away from the Pont Kasolfte, I think that's right, aqueduct, and we're walking towards something I would say is more impressive and I know quite a few people actually agree with me on this. Whilst the, the uh, aqueduct in the sky we call it is amazing in every way, it's the tallest in the world, it's the longest in the UK, it's a truly epic piece of engineering. Years of various things happening make this next section much more special. And you'll find out as we get towards the end of this video. But first of all, we've got just a few other things to do before we get there. One thing you'll notice about this canal is it doesn't really have any locks. It does have locks, it has 21 of them in fact. But the canal itself is, you know, it's 46 miles long and 21 locks going through the area that it runs through. You know, you're into North Wales, famous for being mountainous. So how did they get over this? Well, instead of locks, they built a lot of tunnels and aqueducts, as they're quite famous for. And this is the first of the tunnels on the, on the canal. It's a cut and cover tunnel and it's White Houses. We also see it called Whitehurst Tunnel. I'm not too sure the reason for the two names, but it was, uh, it's an impressive tunnel still. It's cut and cover and only 175 meters long. I've got my torch out so you can get a better view. So this was designed by Thomas Telford and William Jessup. Telford was a young man at the beginning of his career when all this, all this canal was built. So he was kind of watched over by Jessup. Just say it's the shorter of the two tunnels, look at the cut and cover. It's quite fast moving, like the rest of this canal is. I'm not sure if that's just to repair or sign of a shaft. It's quite a short tunnel, so there may not be construction shafts in this one. There's not a huge amount of info online about it. Although it's quite narrow on the top here, you're kind of quite safe because of the balustrades on there. They weren't original. This was a timber deck originally, just in case you don't know which way you're going. I'm gonna guess this is the center of the tunnel. I see no signs of shafts. Uh, the shafts were normally built for longer tunnels, so you could dig down and you would, you would dig down to the level of the tunnel and then you would dig back each way. So it would give you a lot more surfaces to work on, which meant you could build the tunnel much quicker and provide ventilation and somewhere to take the spoil out. But when a, well, a tunnel is 175 meters long, they don't need shafts because it's cut and cover and they don't need it for air. So the main reason here would be air, obviously. This isn't the only tunnel here. We've got another one we're going to see on this video, which is just a little bit further down here. And leads to, oh wow, it's just the whole area is beautiful. with some quite cool engineering on it. So as you may know, I kind of do restorations. I, I'm not, you know, normally on sort of restored canals or working canals. This was abandoned though in 1944 but it was it was kept it wasn't sort of filled in it was it, uh, it was designated as a waterway still and it wasn't until sort of the 70s and 80s that things took off and it was kind of reinstated as a waterway for for cruising and is now i think the aqueduct is probably the busiest in the world i want to say it's something this canal is one of the busiest in the country and that's the reason why I'm here really. It's busy for a reason. The structures on this are just fantastic and you can't ignore them. And as a canal enthusiast, I've got to come visit them. So here's Chirk Marina, another sign of a, a working canal. Lots of boats coming in and out of there. And here we are now approaching the Chirk Tunnel. It's quite imposing from the start. It's quite a wall in front of it. A lot of tunnels start very small and then they kind of, they go up into a steeper hillside, but this is straight into it. It's quite a high wall. The tunnel itself isn't massive, 460 foot long. Leads, leads up to probably one of the most, I would say the better of the, the aqueducts in the area. Not for size, but definitely for everything that's around it. Let's go through and see what we can see. It's very dark in here. Got my torch. 
you can see the other end. I don't think there's any boats coming through at the moment. Yeah. Here we go. So these footways weren't original. They were actually an addition. Originally they were just sort of timber planks and frames, but they changed them for these sort of uh, stone footpaths. So it was a cut and cover tunnel. So they literally, they dug it all out, built the arch and then filled it back in. Some quite cool formations on there, look. And the water running through from the hill. Both the uh, tunnel and the portals are grade two listed. Um, was opened in 1802. It's quite an interesting tunnel for boaters. If you're going northbound, so going to sort of the way we've just come from, you've got to maintain power in here. It's very, very narrow. And you can see there's a leaf there, it's good timing. You can see the water floating through. Now there is, due to the tunnel's quite shallow and there's only just enough sort of width to for the dis displacement of your boat. And the water runs about two miles per hour in sort of that direction. So when you're coming towards this direction, you, you need to constantly be on the throttle. And it's a slow process coming through here. There's a shaft lot. Wow, let me see if I can get a better shot of that. Not sure how well this is gonna come out on this camera. So this one's brick lined. You can see right to the top where it's cobbled over. They wouldn't have been covered it originally. Well, I doubt they would have been. But safety these days, I expect is vented somehow at the top there. This w wasn't the first, although at the time it was deemed as the first uh, tunnel with a footpath, with a towpath. It actually wasn't. The one opened just before it. Uh, so I can't remember where it was, but they did claim for some time that it was, it was the first. But it was definitely one of the first, along with uh, White Houses Tunnel. You can see all through the roof, you've got the white marks. That's where water's running through and it's scaling up. And you start to get formations through. I expect these are cleaned off regularly so you don't get sort of large, uh, can I remember what, is it stalactites they're called? This looks like it may have been a bricked up shaft. It's quite round in nature. I'm not 100% sure whether that is or not. So you may have heard a, a sign to what we're going to see next. May not pick the, the camera may not have picked it up. But just on from here, well, just on the other side of this, where we come from, uh, apart from the big Cadbury's chocolate factory, there is Chirk Railway Station. And there's some sort of little tramway or something going on there as well. I'm, I'm not too sure whether it's been lifted or laid. But what makes this end more impressive to me than the, uh, the aqueduct we can't pronounce behind us. Okay, there was another sign. <laughs> it's the fact that it's not just an aqueduct here. You've also got the incredibly impressive Chirk railway viaduct as well. And both of them combined, as you're gonna see, makes one hell of a spectacle. As you can see this side, the seven portal is nowhere near as high, which is what I was saying. They quite often kind of gradually go into the hill rather than just being a sudden massive embankment, but being a cut and cover tunnel, I expect it was just easier to build a big wall on the other end, uh, retaining it rather than sort of carrying on filling and bricking up an arch. You can actually see quite well on this side as well. You've got the, um, the portal here and it drops down from a quite a large height and goes much shallower as you, as you get into the mouth of the tunnel. It's quite a common thing on tunnels to do that. I'm not too sure if that was an engineering thing or more of a look what I've built kind of thing. I know the box tunnel on, on the uh, Great Western Railway does the same. So here we are, the Chirk Aqueduct. It's 70 foot high, it's 710 foot long and carries obviously the Clan Coffin Canal across the, I think it's a Kirog Valley, probably pronounced that wrong. It was designed by civil engineer Thomas Telford, who's obviously very famous in this area. Just down the road is the, I wanna say city of Telford. The city is actually named after him. The resident engineer on the project was M. Davidson. They started on the 17th of June 1796 when the foundation stone was laid and they completed this in 1801. It's a cast iron trough sat inside here. Despite it being sort of a stone facade, 
They've got a trough in the middle. They had to, they had to do that because of leakage. This was built slightly after the London on Turn aqueduct on the Shrewsbury Canal, which I've covered before. Another very impressive aqueduct. Kind of just pops out in the middle of nowhere in a field. You can see it from the main road. Uh, it's just incredible to see. It was very briefly the tallest aqueduct as well until its mate came along down the road. There's 10 arches in total. Each has a span of 40 foot and it's built of yellow sandstone. William Hazeldean provided the iron work for the aqueduct. He had foundries at Shrewsbury and Keffinmore. So he really initially only had iron sheets on the bottom, iron plates on the base. But uh, they were the, in 1870, they were added on the sides because of the, like I say, because of the leakage. And the, the Chirk Viaduct, it's a grade two listed viaduct. It carries the Shrewsbury to Chester line. It was designed by Henry Robertson, who was the chief engineer of the Shrewsbury and Chester Railway. It was built between 1846 and 1848 by Thomas Brassey and it also had a partial rebuild in 1858 to 1859. They originally only built it with 10 arches despite the design containing 16. The initial 16 arch structure was re reduced to 10 because of engineering concerns concerning the river piers and they would have had to have kind of put two piers into the slopes which they were worried about the structure of. They thought it would be too expensive and because of this aqueduct here uh, the land wouldn't be stable enough to do so. So it was originally built with a timber arch to connect into the main structure which was a 36 and a half metre, 120 foot and they were replaced 10 years later with the three stone arches at either end as you can see here. So kind of where the decoration is there on it is that would have been timber originally in there. It's a train going over. So the central piers, uh, the, the, the arches are 45 foot and it sits about 98 foot above uh, the river. Keep an eye out and next week hopefully will be the Pont, Pont Casolte aqueduct. Did I say that right? I don't think I did. That's, uh, that's an amazing aqueduct. It's, it's huge, biggest, biggest in the world, tallest in the world and longest in the UK, I believe. But thanks for watching. Have a great day.